One of the advantages or disadvantages of being in the last session is that you've heard the whole day of uh, some amazing presentations and many ideas that resonate with things that I've been thinking about as well in my presentation. And so um, it's terrific to, I've been busily scribbling away, adding more notes to things that start to layer my presentation and, and hopefully link back to some of the things that we've talked about previously. And, and not the least of which is that Rachel and I had the same photo, or a similar photo, of a place in New York City that um, is obviously meaningful to both of us. Um, I, I wanted to just say that, in, in the first instance, it strikes me in the conversations we've been having about place and placelessness that a lot of the images that we look at are about architecture and the built form and the accoutrement and the elements, the built elements of, of cities that tend to make them or contribute to their placeless qualities. Um, and I think as a, one of the few landscape architects in the people in place research cluster in our mm. faculty, um, it's been interesting for me to think about just, you know, how, how would I think about placelessness? As a landscape architect, it's so embedded in the way we think about what we do all the time. And so I've had some, it's been interesting to sort of pull this presentation together. And I have to say, it's probably unapologetically a promo for landscape architects and the work we do because it really is um, very much inherent in the way we, we think about the world. I would say it's also um, the products of our work may be somewhat invisible compared to um, the skyscraper condominiums of Toronto and, and other places, um, that there is a tendency to look past the landscape or through the landscape and talk about another kind of place maybe that doesn't um, fully engage with people's thinking about that. So I want to maybe pull some of those ideas out and sh actually show you some great landscape architecture that that has been done around um, Sydney. We are, of course, a hybrid kind of profession as well. We're dealing with, with science and the science of landscapes and place and soil and vegetation and topography um, and climate, um, as well as the art and the understanding of aesthetics and design um, and also factoring into that an understanding of, of social and cultural factors as well. So um, linking back to some of the things John Lang said at the beginning um, about, about the, the cities, that the ground floor is what's really important. Uh, we would agree with that, the ground floor and a little bit above that as well. But I think we'd even go further to say that really a city's character, a city's uh, understanding of place is really fundamentally linked to its landscape setting in the first instance. And so that really is, is where it all springs from. So, um, I mean, really what I'm interested in, and because of my balance of, of practice, practice and, and academic life, um, I'm interested in the, the design and the creation of places that receive and accommodate the Notting Hill carnivals that uh, John Tomini talked about, and the places of celebration, and the places that we transit to um, as we're traveling around the world. And it was great to see Rob's images of landscapes and the way um, some of those um, new ideas about airport design are really relying on, on uh, landscape, landscape identity. And so back to Paley Park, um, I wanted to think of a place in a city that um, always meant a lot to me, that had some other links in terms of how landscape architects were contributing to shaping and reshaping cities. Um, Paley Park was a little project that was done in 1967 in um, New York City, designed by Zion and Breen landscape architects, who also were the landscape architects for the MoMA Sculpture Garden. Features in William White's movie, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, and remembering that his work in that movie was really, um, and his observations were really looking at what a poor job architects had done of designing the, the public plazas at the base of their high-rise office buildings. And so there was a lot of um, observation and discovery about, about those problems that led to some very significant urban design guidelines for the city of New York. In that movie, however, he looks at Paley Park. He also looks at Greenacre Park, which was designed by Sasaki Associates, another landscape architecture practice that, brought, that he claimed and, and celebrated as really great urban spaces. So I visited Paley Park for the first time in 1975 as a graduate student at, at Cornell. And um, 
I, re I realized, and this is the connection, this is the link, it probably would have been about the time you were reviewing your galley proofs for place and placelessness. So those, all those things were starting to kind of come together in my world as a graduate student, thinking about um, ideas uh, that geographers were contributing to the way planners and landscape architects were thinking about the world. And so um, the other thing that occurs to me after listening to um, the presentations today, too, is how um, um, interesting it's been to see how we've all mined Ralph's work in different ways. And in my case, you know, looking for ideas and key concepts that really, well, perhaps validated the work that uh, built environment professionals do in terms of creating place, so that it's not all just something that we think about and theorize about, but it's actually things that we design and deliver. And so I was drawn to um, his ideas in the essay that's uh, in David Seaman's book, Dwelling, Seeing, and Designing Toward a Phenomenological Ecology, talking about distinctive places that are necessary for a reasonable quality of communal life and psychological well-being. Those are, you know, words that still ring very true in the work that we're doing 20-some um, years later. And I loved the comment about genius loci cannot be designed to order. It's not a, like a fast food burger. It's got to evolve, to be allowed to happen, to grow and change from the direct efforts of those who live and work in places and care about them. And so I think some of these words will start to come back to us um, as we look through the work that uh, we'll be talking about. So <clears throat> when I think about place and when we've talked about it in our, our research cluster in anticipation of this um, seminar, I did really kind of have to scratch my head about, you know, how would we talk about this from a landscape architectural perspective because it's so fundamental to the way we view the world and the way we work and the way we teach. We are fundamentally engaged with the public domain all the time. We're interested in you know, how people share space, what they do in space together, how our designs and our thinking enable their interactions. We're constantly working with the complexity of the context, and that's in the full sense of the, world, of the word. So, as I said, creating place is fundamental to the way we view the world, and perhaps we take that for granted. We may speak a bit glibly about um, the way we design for place, create place, giving sites a sense of place. Um, but for the most part, um, we are always, we're working on a physical site, but we're layering that with the history of that place, which, um, which many things have happened before we get there, and trying to understand that, as well as what's going on there now for the people who live around it. And so the social and cultural context of the site is as important for us to understand as the physical nature of the site. Um, and then, of course, we do have um, some of our hybrid colleagues who are sitting in Sydney but designing uh, landscapes in Dubai, designing landscapes in China, designing landscapes in other parts of the world. And perhaps that's where some of these other concepts of, of fluidity and um, cosmopolitanism come into play in terms of how do we take ourselves to those places to try to understand them. Um, we also are, we're, as I said, we're firmly situated in the public domain, um, and we also are thinking about how that space contributes to the green infrastructure of the city. So I was struck yesterday in Ted's presentation, a uh, little diagram of Unwin's um, uh, looking at how skyscrapers and increased density impacts on infrastructure, and that was just the, bare, the gray infrastructure, the roads and the electricity and <coughs> services and all that sort of thing. But it also clearly impacts on the green infrastructure of the city. And um, the ideas of where do people play, where do people go to seek out green space, where does um, nature come into the city to contribute to the urban ecology? How do we find those places and how do we maintain them? So a landscape perspective also, um, going back to the idea of the complexity of the site, we're dealing with the natural systems, the geology, the vegetation, the climate, and the built systems. So clearly the architecture, the hard infrastructure of the site. The social and cultural factors, we've got to understand shifting demographics, who lives there, who's coming to live there in the future, what are the aspirations of these people? How do we engage with community to generate responsive and functional and meaningful places. 
that will not only be used but also grow into a place that is um, valued and becomes part of that um, place that is meaningful to that community. So the ecological and the social science literacy is something that we're trying to not only engender in ourselves but certainly in our, with our students and I think that's those are the areas where we align most closely with cultural geographers and planners. Um, and particularly in the recognition of the increasing diversity of urban populations and the social interactions of people in the public domain makes it uh, more and more um, complex for us to think about the spaces that we're designing. So this gets back to um, having a very com composite understanding of the complexity of the site, of its locality um, within a city or one of the neighborhoods of that place. So we might think of the site within the macro scale of the city, within the sort of meso scale of a, of a precinct or a neighborhood, and then the micro scale at the site. And when we think about our education of landscape architects and how we're, how we're preparing students to become part of, of this activity, we're always looking at how we zoom in and zoom out to those different scales to understand their um, different levels of, of complexity. Uh, we draw on um, a variety of disciplinary traditions uh, in history and theory, and I think that goes back to our, our concern to be balancing science and art and, and social factors all the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so that legacy has evolved around place and understanding people and place in relation to our design discipline. And so for us, the geographer J.B. Jackson has probably been our go-to man in terms of understanding the everyday landscapes and, and the cultural significance of those places and their physical um, uh, significance. Um, Kevin Lynch's work, Mark Tribe more recently, um, and in the current uh, parlance of landscape urbanism, certainly James Corner's work and our own Richard Weller, who's now at the University of Pennsylvania, but um, coming out of, of, of our program here at UNSW. So I think these are the, the new wave of, of theorists who are bringing an, an understanding of the fundamental aspects of landscape as the basis for um, building place and understanding place. We design to enable shared use and enhance the experience of users, and so our, our, how we get an understanding of people and their needs. Um, William White is somebody that, that we, again, have looked to over the years, the social life of small urban spaces and his close and astute observations of recording and analyzing people's behavior continues to be um, a, the way we, we uh, look at things. Uh, Jan Gale's work has followed on from that and he also is very uh, well known to us in Sydney for the, uh, and Melbourne, Adelaide. He's been a, a, in a lot of cities around the world and I think the interesting thing with Gale's work is how the universal methodology is still enabling some very unique and specific um, understandings of, of people in place to come out of that. Uh, Claire Cooper Marcus's um, her contribution to landscape architecture as a, as a geographer, but as somebody who brought to us, really, the findings of important environment behavior research and helped to interpret that and helped to see um, how planners and designers could bring those ideas into their practice and not just talk about them and understand them in a theoretical way, but really translate them into contributions that we could bring into our own work. And then more recently, uh, Robin Moore continues in that vein, um, and particularly in the work with children and young people that um, some of us are involved with. I also, um, in, in my own learning and in introducing these ideas to our students, I think those uh, public domain activists, Jane Jacobs, um, Randy Hester currently, Jeffrey Howe at the University of Washington, are people who are looking at and Jeffrey in particular, looking at the diverse experiences of people in, in, in cities, the diversity of cultural groups and marginalized communities, and, and looking at the particularities of their needs in the cities where we're, where we're working. So finally, another thing too that we're juggling all the time is this response to the increasing urgency of climate change and of for many years, the issues around environmental sustainability and now spatial justice. Uh, Fritz Steiner's work and Spurn, both um, following on from the work of Ian McCarg, 
the 21st century landscape urbanists I mentioned. Um, these are people that um, are, again, helping us and pushing us to look at these ideas in a bigger context. And I think um, I noted Ted's uh, 2006 essay when he was um, in Hobart, I believe it was, at the conference, uh, talking there about the importance of, of giving credence and giving concern to the issues for changing climate and people's connection to place because if there isn't a concern about it or care about it, there's no, um, the prospects for that severe um, environmental degradation will go unnoticed if we're not on alert because of our caring and our concern for the, um, for the places where we live. So working with all of these principles, we, we think fundamentally we are um, you know, avoiding um, outcomes that create placeless places. Um, and we hope that that can continue to be the case, but it's something that we have to be mindful of. And I ask our students, um, so do, what do you reckon? Can we design a sense of place? Can we build a sense of place? <coughs> we talk about that a lot, and you hear uh, practitioners in their presentations to councils and, and other clients, you know, we're creating a sense of place, but can we really do that? And uh, Ralph's comment in this 2006 uh, presentation was, while it's possible to design environments that enhance or diminish place, it's no more possible to design my sense of place than it is to design my memory. And I think that in itself starts to help students understand some of these rather complex ideas about, you know, perception and where do ideas around place come from. Certainly there was um, a period of time at UNSW when the Vice Chancellor felt you could design a sense of place and reconstructing the campus um, to the configuration that it's in at the moment was meant to convey to the rest of the world a sense of a university place at UNSW. Um, and it's been interesting to see how that um, idea has, has been used so uh, prominently in, in marketing literature and will we may have a discussion about place branding and place marketing around that as well. But Genius Loci, so where did that all come from? Have you read this and thought about this poem for a while? Um, good old Alexander Pope. We talk a lot about consulting the genius of the place, but I thought it would be fun to just go back and look at the original comments. And what was he talking about anyway? Well, clearly, um, in 1731, Alexander Pope was, he was writing poetry, but he was also doing a bit of garden making, but not in the public domain so much, in, in the private domain of uh, large landholders. So he talks about consulting the genius of the place in all that tells the waters or to rise or fall, or helps the ambitious hill the heavens to scale, or scoops in circling theaters the veil, calls in the country, catches opening glades, joins willing woods and varies shades from shades, how breaks or now directs the intending lines, paints as you plant and as you work designs. So Pope is saying, just consult the site and the site will tell you what it wants to be. And it all seems fairly, fairly easy, but obviously much more complex um, these days than it was in 1730. So placemaking then. <clears throat> With, with Pope, and I think it's fair to say that fundamentally the ideas are still there. We do still consult the genius of the place in terms of those, those physical uh, realities, but in more contemporary ways, obviously. We're not uh, writing poetry about it. We have much more sophisticated technology, and we're sometimes doing it even remotely. But as Pope suggested, the site will tell you what it wants to be and how it is to be designed. So today, in, for placemaking or for designing places, we consult the community and we say, what do you want? And, is, and I think the question might be, is that simply what we do? We simply ask what they want? Um, is this really placemaking? And unfortunately, I think that perhaps there are, there's a sense that if we just ask the community, they'll tell us what we want and that will lead to the design but we have to think about that a little more deeply. And I was pleased to see um, Ted's reference to the Project for Public Spaces, PPS, and their notions of placemaking. Um, and I think it's an interesting time for landscape architects relative to PPS because we're operating in the same sphere. We're operating in the public domain. And public, uh, PPS has done a marvelous job. They're a nonprofit organization and they're fantastic. they have a fantastic reach. They've done a great job of promoting themselves, as, as Ted showed us, uh, as the hub 
of, of placemaking, uh, the global hub of, of placemaking. And as part of their um, discourse about public places in the public domain, they have a blog, as you would in these days. And this was a recent um, posting on their blog, and it just coincidentally was two places in Toronto, which you may know, Ted, I'm not sure. But the title was, Whom Does Design Really Serve? And the proposition was that on the left was a new, it's actually Sherborne Common, I believe is its proper name in, in Toronto, a new project, recently uh, receiving a national award from the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects. Um, and of course, great derision about the level of, of friendliness and uh, human activity that was represented in this picture um, about the, 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 the project. And on the right, another place, called Dufferin Grove Park in Toronto, which undesigned, not designed, but a place that people preferred to be. And what was it about these two places that would be uh, one better than the other to be in? And I think the, you know, obviously the concern here is that uh, we don't know much about what the brief was for the Sherburne Common Park. Um, but I was curious to see what people on Yelp had to say about it. And uh, the people on Yelp were quite excited about Sherborne Common. Um, and so we have, again, this is another twist on how we find out about what people want, um, is to see what they're, how they're talking about it, how, not only observing them in place, but observing how they're responding to places by loading up their photos, their selfies, um, loading up their commentary about what they do in places, why they love it, um, and registering public opinion that that in turn can influence perceptions about place. And we've seen this happening in Sydney in um, some public projects lately too. One uh, playground out at the Sydney Olympic Park at the Blacksland Riverside um, Park area that uh, before it even opened was absolutely swamped with families every weekend um, and has been the most popular destination for families to go on the weekends simply because a few people got out there got into the site and started using it before it was actually ready to be used. And so that went viral on social media, and before you knew it, the place was a big hit. So I think we have multiple ways now of consulting the genius of the community, um, locally in face-to-face -face sort of situations and engagement, and then also asking and watching to see what they do um, on social media. So I would say the Project for Public Spaces um, trade on the legacy of William White and his methodology. They're not nearly as genial as um, William White seemed to be. I think, they're, um, I think it's unfortunate that they have um, such an antagonistic view toward design and designers. And uh, it seems to get into the situation where it interferes with us being able to have the kind of collaborative um, associations that really can only benefit everybody. Um, so, this case in point, the blog is, um, I would like, would remind us to um, be widespread in the way we regard um, community commentary on, on public places. The idea of reclaiming and making places in Sydney is something that I've been looking at and thinking about in, in the context of a, a little research project, or I hope will be a bigger research project that will lead to a publication soon. And again, looking at Ralph's comments in um, his essay of 1993 about the important role for architects and landscape architects and planners and social scientists, and I would say with social scientists, to reclaim and make places. And initially, and most importantly, to develop a sensitivity to the attributes of those places. And then find ways of initiating and directing locally committed developments. So that local commitment, again, goes back to the people that live there, goes to the the um, government agencies and the local councils and sometimes even state and federal politicians. So I just wanted to um, show you a few of the projects that um, I'm going to be looking at um, and looking at them in detail. It's a series of case studies that go through a critical analysis of these projects um, designed by and led largely by Australian landscape architects constructed in and around Sydney, and you can see some other dots on, on this um, sort of diagrammatic plan where they are. The three that we'll be looking at today are Paddington Reservoir, Ballast Point, and Pyramid Park. The focus is on projects 
built in Sydney after 2000, which was, of course, when Sydney hosted the um, Olympic Games. And I picked that date because I really, when you look at the projects after that point in time, it was a pivotal moment for landscape architects. Um, they were developing a focus on design responses, I think, that were very unique to the city's landscape and its regional context. And importantly, they were taking the lead on major um, projects of significance with increasing scale and increasing complexity. And they required close collaboration with architects and urban designers and planners and community. And so what I'm imagining is that the projects featured in this book will demonstrate the increasingly prominent role of landscape architects in creating the contemporary public domain of Sydney and how those projects have created innovative and sustainable solutions uh, for these engaging open spaces and hopefully places that are of great meaning to the people who use them. And the other dimension to this that I'm looking at as well is how those projects sit in the context of Sydney's increasing residential density. What's going on around them in their context in terms of the number of people that are, are being, um, in some cases, shoehorned into uh, suburbs of, of the city that haven't had that level of density in the past and what impact is that having on, on green spaces. Um, all three of the projects are on reclaimed and remade sites, post-industrial or reclaimed heritage infrastructure. They all have fascinating stories of the ins and outs of how they were developed, and I won't go into all the details of that now, but they owe their existence to a combination of the politics, um, of the gritty determination of community groups that insisted on them coming into being, and also um, on featuring and revealing, I think the landscape architects at that point in time, again, because of the legacy of the sustainability green games message that came through in the preparation for the Olympic site, there was an ongoing issue about being sure that these projects featured and revealed the urban ecologies and were in fact in their time some of the best practice sustainability approaches. So the first one of these sites is the Paddington Reservoir Park on Oxford Street in Paddington. The lead landscape architects on this were JMD design landscape architects working with Tonkin Zuleika Greer architects. Um, this is a site that was um, one of the earliest reservoirs in the colony built in about 1864. And because of its size, it didn't, um, didn't last very long. It wasn't very operable as a, uh, as a reservoir. So after about 30 years, it was abandoned for those purposes. And uh, in the 1940s, sometime later, became a petrol station. So there were all sorts of um, other things going on there. There was a, had a grass roof over it. It was a park that was very popular and so on. Worked pretty well until about the 1990s when the, the roof started to subside and collapse eventually, revealing this amazing space underneath that had been the reservoir spaces. And so it was, in the words of J.B. Jackson, uh, one of those wonderful ruins in a city that became a, a, a sense, you know, a, there was a lot of curiosity about it and there was a lot of uh, speculation as to how that could become um, a, a place of value to the, to the, um, to the city. Um, there is a great, over this period of time, um, there was a great toing and froing about how it might be developed, what it might be. Uh, it was weighed in, the discussion about it weighed into by <coughs> Clover Moore, who was the mayor of Sydney, who was very uh, supportive of the idea of this being turned into a very special kind of park. And so um, an open space that's below grade that you can't see at all when you walk down um, Oxford Street, you wouldn't know it was a park until you came right up to the edge of it and had a peek over. And then um, that sense of discovery of, of coming into this sort of amazing, intriguing space is, is really something very special. And might actually, I was thinking, Rachel, be a good spot if you haven't already to do some soundscape uh, measuring because the difference between being on Oxford Street with the passing traffic and, and the footpath, or the foot traffic and, and vehicular traffic, it's a completely different environment below. And everything tells us um, in other studies about parklands below grade is that you just wouldn't do it. You wouldn't put a park below the footpath, but in this case, the size of it, the scale of it, the location of it does work. And so it is a place that 
unless you're there for a <coughs> party, uh, which does happen. Um, it's not a place where there are probably lots of traffic in it and moving through it because you have to make a, a definite decision to go down into it. But when I see things like people going in to colonize it for an office meeting or, or something like that, it becomes a place that somebody for a brief period of time or a group of people can, can colonize and call their own. So it's an intriguing, um, interesting place in the city and certainly a distinctive um, public open space. Another one um, that looking at is Ballast Point Park, which is on the Birch Grove um, Peninsula in Balmain. Um, as its name suggests, it was a park that uh, was quarried for ballast in the colonial days, and so lo ships were loaded with this material uh, to sail back to, to England. This is a park that was designed um, originally master planned by Anton James, who's now JMD Design, and Craig Burton with Context Landscape Architects. And typically, um, as often happens in New South Wales, one group does the master planning and somebody else gets to come along and do the design and documentation. This is a view of the park um, very soon after it was completed when it looked very clean and sharp and crisp, and it's starting to soften now. Um, as the vegetation grows. And I love this picture because there's nothing on the original plans about programming for a bocce court, but it has been um, colonized that way on the weekends by this group of locals. And has a distinctive orientation to the harbor with panoramic views of the harbor, uh, back to the harbor bridge, so you always have a sense of where you are in Sydney. And the love locks on the Gabion walls are, again, another marker, a trace of the way people are claiming this as their own place. Uh, finally, Pyrama Park at Piermont on Sydney Harbor. Um, this kind of made me think of some of the images um, Ted was showing yesterday of Toronto, but probably a little more like Vancouver maybe in scale for, for the residential. And certainly much better um, relationship to spectacular harbor, but also green space. And so the prospect of families um, and, and young couples with, with children living in this area, this is a place to access, as, as well as for joggers and, and recreational walkers. But it's also a great park um, that's a, a destination for people from all over Sydney, and in fact from the western suburbs, who drive in to use a fabulous playground and an environment of green um, that is you know, something that they're not getting in their own neighborhood or is unique to this part of the city. And again, more elements, more um, evidence of people calling this place their own and, and claiming it for their use. Um, a, another little spot that I, I, as I was putting these together, I thought, well, sure, you can do distinctive landscapes if you've got millions of dollars and you've got, you can hardly go wrong when you're on Sydney Harbor. Uh, but this little project by Craig Burton that was completed in 1998, I think, is just a gem. And, and the um, Institute of Landscape Architects thought so, too, when they awarded it a National Project Award in 2000. Cost $250,000 in those days, so a much different scale project, but just an absolute gem of a spot, and certainly I think one of the most um, exquisite uh, senses of place for a for a public um, public place in the city. I'm interested in Kevin Thwaites' work on um, the experiential landscape and how he talks about emphasizing the experiential whole of a place rather than just looking at the material and spatial composite. And so in my work on this, on this project, it's not meant to be a coffee table book that just describes beautiful landscapes, but really looking at the context of the place, how people use it, how they've come to inhabit it, um, how they value it, and how it has truly become part of the Sydney landscape. And so I believe, just in conclusion, that landscape architects do elude placelessness by creating distinctive places in the urban landscape. And it's important that we keep pushing that and keep um, referring to that in the work that we do. I think it extends our understanding of the context, the physical and the social context, and it keeps us alert to the dynamics of change. <coughs> We need to engage continuously as professionals with the community so that we understand them, but so we also help engender a sense of place, uh, which I think in the long run also builds their prospects for resilience. Um, quoting my colleague Catherine Evans, it helps us stay grounded, um, especially in areas where our city is changing rapidly and we have um, increasing density and increasing populations we have to accommodate, how do we stay grounded, and how do we help connect people to the landscape of their city. And I think finally it honors the genius loci of the place of Sydney, contributes 
in the words of Ted Relf, to the quality of communal life and psychological well-being. Thank you.